Right. Good. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to uh, start this meeting. So today we have the signing ceremony of the new initiative project, Comprehensive Resilience Building in the Chimanimani and Chipinge districts of Zimbabwe, which is an initiative under the Zimbabwe Dye Recovery Project that is um, funded by the World Bank and managed by UNOPS. And we also welcome colleagues from UNOPS here. Um, it's my role just to introduce the agenda and then uh, go to the session of the day. So. Uh, my name is Kun Verbist and I'm the program specialist for uh, national science sector in the UNESCO Regional Office for Southern Africa. The, the agenda for today, um, we'll start with an opening session and we have uh, two representatives here, one from UNESCO, the uh, representative and, and uh, office director for the Regional Office for Southern Africa, as well as uh, Mr. Jibril Lamazin, who is country manager for the United Nations Office for Project Services, UNOPS. And we'll follow up with a brief presentation given by UNESCO colleagues. And we follow up then with a short signing ceremony for the official agreement between UNESCO and UNOPS. I will be followed by a vote of thanks by Ms. Becky Mansov. She's director of the Meteorological Services Department. And we have some final closing remarks from Ms. Tondurai Fadzi Naume, who is the co task team leader for the ZIRP of World Bank office here in uh, Zimbabwe. So with that, I would just like to give uh, the floor to um, our regional director and representative for UNESCO, uh, Hubert Geisen, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Kun. Uh, uh, dear colleagues and uh, friends, uh, let me just say all protocols observed. Uh, but of course, I would like to give special recognition to my dear colleague uh, who's next uh, to me here, Jibril. Um, uh, from UNOPS, uh, but also the Secretary General of the Zimbabwe National Commission for UNESCO, uh, and our colleague from the Department of Meteorological uh, Services. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thanks to all present here. Uh, we have a hybrid meeting today. Uh, some uh, were fortunate enough to make it to the uh, UNESCO regional office. We're here gathered in the, in the meeting room. Uh, but many more of you are connected out there. So uh, to all of you, a very good morning and uh, welcome to this uh, signing ceremony uh, during which you will hear a bit more about this new project that is going to be launched on comprehensive resilience building in the Chimanimani and uh, Chipinge districts. Um, so this project uh, will be implemented by UNESCO as part of the Zimbabwe EDI recovery project. Uh, and this is funded uh, via the World Bank and managed by UNOPS. And this new initiative uh, is a reconfirmation of the commitment of the United Nations system here in Zimbabwe to really come together and to deliver as one. And we would like to mobilize uh, the best uh, expertise that we have in the UN system that we have available to support the government uh, and, the, and the people of Zimbabwe. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, as, as you know, uh, climate change in this region, in Southern Africa in general, uh, and in Zimbabwe in particular, uh, has resulted in an increase in the frequency of water-related hazards. <clears throat> and we have seen so many of them uh, in, the, in the past years that I've been here. I've witnessed a whole series of events. Um, the region is, uh, as we know, exposed to, to multiple weather-related hazards uh, with frequent cyclones. Uh, the more recent ones, uh, Idai and Kenneth, have hit uh, Zimbabwe as well. Um, but also uh, extreme droughts, um, floods, um, and then associated with that, especially with the floods, also uh, health uh, epidemics. And Zimbabwe in particular has been uh, severely affected by the El Nino and, and the La Nina uh, induced droughts and, and subsequent floods. Um, and, and this has resulted in the loss of lives, uh, properties, infrastructure, and it has severely affected the livelihoods uh, of so many. Uh, and also it has further pushed down an already stressed economy uh, in the country. 
Now, as you know, two years ago, Zimbabwe was uh, hit uh, together with its neighboring countries, uh, particularly Mozambique was hard hit, Malawi, uh, by two subsequent uh, cyclones, Idai and Kenneth. It is almost exactly two years ago. Uh, and these left a trail of destruction in their path. Um, it is estimated that uh, Cyclone Idai and, and the subsequent uh, flooding that occurred uh, destroyed more than 770 million US dollars in, in infrastructure, in buildings, in, in houses, in crops. Don't, don't forget about the immense damages that happen in the agricultural sector as well. Uh, more than 100,000 homes were damaged uh, or completely destroyed. And, and think about the livelihoods of so many that were negatively affected by this. And as demonstrated by the impacts of these cyclones, uh, there was a clear need in the Southern Africa region to move towards resilience building and to move towards more proactive disaster risk uh, reduction. And, and therefore, a more focused effort is needed to provide adequate flood monitoring and early warning capacities for Zimbabwe and to strengthen uh, long term resilience building to water related hazards. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, UNESCO, in fact, mobilizes all its mandates towards disaster risk reduction. You, some may wonder, if you look from far and you don't know UNESCO well, you may think of this uh, nice organization that takes care of the World Heritage Sites. Uh, or if you know a bit more, that we work in education as well. Uh, well, actually, UNESCO has five main mandates, and, and it mobilizes all these five mandates uh, in this particular area of disaster management as well. Uh, just a few words on that via education, uh, of course, and uh, we have curricular approaches uh, where we create more knowledge and awareness by learners, by teachers, and via them for entire communities uh, on how to be better prepared and how to respond when disaster strikes. Uh, in the sciences, we have supported countries in, in strengthening uh, tsunami early warning systems. Uh, and also we have worked uh, in, uh, in the area of water related disasters uh, on early warning systems uh, for extreme hydrological events. In the area of culture, uh, we are very much concerned and engaged uh, with the protection and safeguarding of world heritage sites. And uh, also after disaster has hit, uh, we're working uh, with uh, the, the authorities to recover and restore these cultural heritage uh, sites. In the domain of social and human sciences, so as you can see, the S of UNESCO has the natural sciences, but also the social and human sciences. Uh, we have developed programs that, that look at the most vulnerable in times of disaster, like people with disability. Um, and then lastly, the area of CI, and we will hear more about that. Uh, I see Alamin is here, our head of the uh, communication and information uh, department. And, and let me clarify, this is not the PR uh, side of the house. We do have a PR, uh, but this is the content of communication and information. And in this area, we help member states to fight myths and disinformation that always pops up in times of disaster. You can imagine how busy we have been in times of COVID. Uh, we saw that myths and disinformation spread faster than the virus itself. And we have supported governments in, in that, in fighting that. Uh, but also help communities to set up uh, uh, communications via community radio, for instance. Uh, you will uh, imagine how important communications are when disaster strikes, uh, not only when it happened and the chaos is there and you need to communicate, but also before as a means to, uh, to, to support early warning information and to disseminate that information. 
so we're very happy that uh, we have also uh, have recently started uh, to strengthen our cooperation with the Ministry of Communication and Information in the area of community radio. So in, in the Southern Africa region, uh, we recently developed uh, in collaboration with Princeton University, uh, the flood and drought monitors uh, that was done for Mozambique and Zimbabwe. Uh, and these systems provide a platform to monitor and to provide forecasts uh, of upcoming flood and, and drought hazards. And this helps to, to strengthen flood and drought uh, risk management in these countries. Now, let me come to the event today and, and with the, the signing of today's uh, agreement, we continue our commitment to uh, support disaster risk reduction efforts in Zimbabwe. This project aims to, to reduce the vulnerability of communities in the Chimani Mani and Chipinge districts uh, their vulnerability to uh, natural disasters like floods, uh, droughts, but also landslides, uh, and to uh, enhance at the same time, so that is on the one hand, and on the other hand, also to enhance water resources and ecosystem services management, because these go hand in hand. Um, and this will uh, be achieved by uh, really a bottoms up approach uh, by involving the local communities in the, in the two districts. Uh, and this is to ensure uh, that we are tailoring uh, relevant solutions to the local needs, to the local situation. Uh, this project is, uh, as I said, part of the Zimbabwe EDI recovery project. This is a four year a grant of 72 million uh, US dollars, which came from the International Development Association Crisis Response Window. Uh, and the financial support is managed uh, via the World Bank. Uh, it, is, it is channeled via the World Bank, but managed uh, through uh, UNOPS. Um, and this, this has a dual objective, uh, of course, to alleviate the impacts of Cyclone Idai on the one hand and to build resilience uh, of local communities on the other. The project we will sign today, uh, so that's part of the bigger picture, uh, will contribute to ensure that uh, the two districts uh, are better prepared for future extreme water-related events. Um, and, and also to shift towards more proactive disaster risk management. Um, it, is, it is really amazing to see how inefficiently we have dealt with disasters in the past. Our response also in the UN system uh, typically has been, and I'm talking about the past now, has been humanitarian response. So when the mess is in the chaos is complete, we, we send food support, medical support, uh, uh, reconstruction efforts. And, and this is uh, so terribly expensive. So we need to shift towards more towards prevention and prevention is not always possible. You can't stop an earthquake. You can't stop a hydrological event. But preparedness is what you can do, uh, and thereby uh, minimizing, uh, reducing the impact and having people and communities better prepared. And I think that is a, a wise approach, which is not only saving more lives and goods and infrastructure, it is also very much more cost effective. In the medical sector, we, we have that slogan, prevention is better than cure. Let's apply the same in the real world and uh, in the context of disasters. So the, the challenges uh, identified are tremendously complex and, and disasters affect communities in multiple ways. Uh, and through its mandate, UNESCO will address these vulnerabilities in, in various ways. And as I referred earlier to the different mandates, we will mobilize these towards this project as well. Uh, by developing scientific solutions, by improving local information sharing through the uh, introduction, uh, as I said earlier, by, of community radio, uh, and also by strengthening educational capacities 
on disaster risk reduction and making the school environment a safer place. Uh, UNESCO is committed to leaving no one behind and, and therefore also supports the, the most vulnerable groups, uh, such as people with uh, disabilities. Um, and, and this is so important, especially when disaster strikes. Um, uh, I mean, just just uh, try to imagine this this uh, the impact of Idai uh, when this happened. There's massive chaos. Uh, everyone in panic. Uh, everyone trying to react, respond, save save their lives, save their families. And now imagine the same. And you are impaired. Uh, you can't run. You can't walk. You are impaired. You can't see. Uh, what, what kind of a tremendous uh, limitation is that to respond to disaster? So let us leave no one behind. Let us also uh, have a special, uh, a special attention for those uh, who are usually left behind. I, uh, <clears throat> I would like uh, in closing uh, just to say this, uh, all the partners involved, I uh, wish you a very successful implementation uh, in this very interesting uh, uh, adventure. Uh, I thank the World Bank, I, I thank UNOPS uh, for their trust and for their partnership, um, which uh, will directly benefit the communities in Chimanimani and Chipinge. I would also like to reiterate UNESCO's commitment to continue working together with the government of Zimbabwe and its partners in support of a more resilient Zimbabwe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Hubert. And I would like to move then to the uh, introductory remarks from Mr. Jibril Amazin, country manager of UNOPS. Thank you, thank you. Good morning, everybody. First of all, thank you for welcoming uh, us in your office in, in person. I think it's uh, something that we've been missing for a long time. So uh, since you have a great place, uh, it allows us to, uh, to see each other by respecting distance and all the, the health protocols. So thank you for that. Uh, I also hear that you have uh, the only uh, self-sustained office and uh, green office. <laughs> so that's also a uh, a recognition that, that we all look uh, forward to. That's, uh, that's great to, uh, to see that and to hear that. So um, it's, uh, it's really a, a pleasure, at least for me, to, um, to be part of this uh, uh, signing ceremony. Uh, a lot has been said already uh, about, um, you know, the, the, the context uh, of, this, uh, of this program, the Zimbabwe Die Recovery Program, that's financed by the World Bank. Um, but just to mention as well that since we are indeed at the second uh, uh, year anniversary of, of uh, Cyclone Idai. This week is actually representing uh, the same week of, of the cyclone since it hit. Uh, it, uh, it made landfall on 16th of March uh, of 2019. Um, and it's, I guess, uh, an another uh, another uh, uh, record, uh, reminder of how important it is to address, obviously, all those uh, climate change and to look at disaster risk management. So uh, bringing UNESCO on board onto the, the ZERP uh, program, I think uh, to us is, uh, is very timely. Um, uh, certainly, we, I think we could have done that actually earlier, but very, very timely uh, to have done that now. Uh, and, and we are very happy that uh, this collaboration uh, is started. Um, I would provide maybe a, a just a, a very short uh, overview of what is the ZERP in, in, uh, in, in essence. And that's a, a program that uh, started in 2019. Um, it's built on the three components. We have the first component that is a uh, immediate recovery, uh, and that was supported through uh, uh, WFP, uh, mainly WFP and FAO. And that the intention was really to respond very quickly to the devastation of the cyclone. So WFP was involved in uh, obviously the, their mandate with food food security, uh, 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 food insecurity assistance, etc. And FAO with all the aspects of uh, crops and livestock uh, inputs. Uh, trainings, irrigation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's really the the, the first uh, the first recovery. We also had WHO who, who mobilized very quickly since the access to health was very limited at the beginning, and and covered with the systems of mobile clinics, uh, basic health uh, needs in the in the areas that were most affected. The second component is more on the on the medium term recovery. That's really the one that we are basically uh, we transition into. Uh, uh, 
the la in the last few months, the, the first part, the first year of the project focused really on the early recovery. But we now transition really on the, onto the second uh, component. And that medium term to longer term recovery really looks at uh, more of the, the, the asset side, the infrastructure side, the more consistent side of the, of the recovery. Uh, and that involves UNICEF. UNICEF has a strong role with the WASH activities, uh, as well as UNOPS with community, uh, community infrastructure. And we have a third component, uh, which overall strengthens uh, the other two components. And that's where we see the collaboration of uh, IOM, who has provided uh, additional data, uh, more accurate data on, uh, on uh, IDPs in order to support also and, and have a specific focus also on those most vulnerable uh, communities, not only affected by a cyclone, but then in a, in a situation of displacement, which, uh, which uh, creates uh, even more vulnerabilities. Uh, in addition to that, we have UNFPA uh, also supporting uh, the activities by providing GBV uh, services, GBV threatening services. So it's, uh, it's a strong uh, seven UN agency collaboration. Uh, as you've I've just summarized very quickly, you can see how all those components work well uh, together. Uh, while you cannot just uh, intend to uh, provide recovery by focusing on one single sector, I think this, this program, while very ambitious, uh, very difficult to put in place at the beginning, and again, I think uh, we must thank the leadership of, uh, of the World Bank on that, as well as all the, the head of agencies that, that participated from the beginning in the, in the building and designing of the program. Uh, it, it shows that uh, by putting all efforts together and, and, and counting on each other uh, comparative advantage, we really multiply the impact. The effect is multiplied. It's not a single siloed effect per sector. But now by bringing it, bringing it together, I, be, I believe the, 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 the benefits to the communities that are supported, specifically in the two districts uh, that were most affected, Chimanimani and Chipinge, uh, is, is multiplied. So uh, in, the, in the end, it's just... Uh, uh, to, in the best interest again to uh, to the beneficiaries so uh, um, that's that's in a, in a nutshell really what uh, what uh, what the SERP is uh, is about I would like to mention as well that it's really a unique uh, program it doesn't exist anywhere else uh, at, at the moment uh, we hope that it will then uh, take place or at least will help shape other programs like this one uh, it has never been uh, uh, the case where you have the World Bank funding uh, a program managed by one agency, in this case UNOPS, and then having it implemented by so many UN agencies. Um, so we are hoping to, uh, to continue show, showcasing that uh, it can work, that uh, through this uh, type of collaboration and understanding of each other's uh, expertise, uh, we, can, we can have a stronger, and as I said before, a, a, an impact that is uh, really multiplied. Um, with the, the collaboration with the UNESCO, so the, 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 the signing ceremony that, uh, that we are here for, uh, we will hear a bit more detail about it and uh, there is a presentation afterwards on this, so I will not uh, talk much about it. Uh, the, we've heard that you know, it's really about uh, reduction of disaster uh, uh, risk and as well uh, resilience building, so we're, we're really looking forward to um, the inputs of, of, of UNESCO to, to, to strengthen our activities uh, under ZERP and overall uh, make it more, uh, more resilient. Because as I said, we, had, we have the component one while focusing on medium recovery has also a strong look forward towards building that resilience and obviously reducing the, the, the risk to, uh, to, future, to future shocks. Um, so we'll just close by saying that as, as UNOPS, it's really a, 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 an honor for me to, to, to represent UNOPS and signing this, uh, this collaboration with you uh, on behalf uh, somehow of the, of the World Bank, since the funding is coming from the World Bank and from the UNOPS project implementation unit, unit side, it's also a, um, a, great, uh, a great day in the sense that we are, we are uh, even more proud to show uh, additions to the uh, to, to this uh, uh, strong collaboration that is uh, that is happening. So uh, I will just close by welcoming UNESCO as the eighth UN agency ZERP and looking forward uh, to a strong collaboration and expanding the collaboration in the future. Thank you. Great. Much to Gabriel uh, for that introduction, and uh, we're very uh, happy to be part of the, the bigger team. Um, so I just want to give uh, the colleagues uh, in the room as well as uh, online a short uh, presentation together with my colleague uh, Alamin, who will be part of this presentation. Uh, so in, in, uh, I will just uh, 
slides here so I can look better. Um, so the objectives of the project were already introduced. So we're aiming to reduce the vulnerabilities of the communities in the Chimani Mani and Chipingi districts to natural disasters. And we'll be zooming in, of course, on the issues um, caused by Idai, basically floods and landslides, but also, of course, looking at droughts, specifically when looking at climate change impacts. So that's the second part where we're looking at enhancing water resources and ecosystem service management in response to the uncertainty of future climate change, which certainly has a very short term, but also medium to long term uh, improvement of uh, capacities in building. Of course, also we want to make sure we support uh, UNEP's uh, community infrastructure project under the ZERP to make sure we support identification of critical locations for resilience building work in those districts. So we're, we already know the um, areas of work. So we're focusing on two districts, Chimanimani and Chipinge, with a uh, joint overall uh, population of almost 500,000 uh, people. That will be our focus uh, for the next uh, period. The project scope itself um, has two areas. The first one is really about identifying risks, and that will be part one of the project, while the second part is really about building that resilience. I'll just give you a bit of a more detail about those two parts, right? Okay. So part one is about disaster risk mapping in the two districts. And the first one is about identifying better the flood risks in those areas. And I can see as the example, which is given uh, on the lower part, is we need really to understand in much better detail, what are the expected flood events, identifying flood hazard zones, but also potential evacuation routes. And we're therefore we're using state-of-the-art um, hazard mapping approaches and techniques to really identify the probability of flooding at very high resolution. And we're talking here about 90 meters of spatial resolution. That of course has to be combined with information about socioeconomical conditions and livelihoods so that we know when we have a potential exposure to these kind of um, events, we can also identify what would be the response capacity of the people being affected by those events, which of course then builds more capacity to identify their vulnerabilities and eventually their risk. A similar uh, effort is being done also on the part of landslides. And of course, we know that um, just after uh, Idai uh, hit, we had a massive amount of landslides. And in fact, our colleagues have been mapping the number of landslides that have been affected um, the two districts, and they have already found more than a thousand landslides that happened just after Idai struck the region. So that just gives you the, uh, the information about the massive impact that it had on landslides. And of course, landslides had a very deadly toll in the region as well. So the effect or the activities we would like to um, embark on is about monitoring and assessing landslide hazards. But specifically, we want to come up with very detailed information for example, which areas are susceptible to landslides, again, at very high resolution of 90 meters, which, of course, gives us an understanding of the areas which are under threat. But we also want to go beyond that and looking at risk, which means we need to identify for some of the hotspots what are the vulnerabilities uh, and which areas are effectively in the pathway of potential further landslides. That, of course, can, can then come up with more information for action. And one of the things we would like to explore is if we can go towards more of an early warning approach where that information can be used to build uh, modeling efforts to bring in information on the when we can expect the next landslides to be activated. So that's certainly uh, something that the project can contribute to, and we hope that actually will lead to further early warning capacities. The third element is a bit more longer term and is about climate change. We, of course, know that droughts have also been very important, and, and the combination of these uh, intermittent floods and droughts becomes very destabilizing for populations. So we also want to look into what is the impact of climate change into medium and long-term water resource uh, planning. And therefore UNESCO has developed a tool with some of its partners um, globally. And that tool is called CRIDA or Climate Risk Informed Decision Analysis, where we try to integrate climate change uncertainty into the identification of ecosystem-based adaptation strategies and to enable flexible decision-making processes. That will be applied to the Chimanimani area in two phases, where we're looking at medium to long-term water environmental vulnerability assessment, as well as a more active engagement, a bottom-up approach, engaging stakeholders to identify potential adaptation pathways. And maybe just to highlight also that uh, World Bank recently published an, uh, a study, an independent assessment, where the CRIDE approach has been 
indicated as one of the uh, methodologies that receive an A-plus rating to establish resilience of water resource management to climate change. This is actually giving us also uh, indications that that methodology is efficient and effective to address the issue. In terms of part two, when we're looking at resilience building, we want to go beyond the status quo at the moment. And uh, at this point, we have been collaborating with the partners in, in government um, to develop effective um, flood and drought monitoring information at national level, uh, coming from a regional approach, which was done uh, with Princeton University in the 2011 uh, onwards. We now are zooming in on national uh, capacities and we're supporting MSD, Zinwa and other agencies to um, have better forecast cap capabilities for the short and the medium term. But we also want to go beyond that because of course at the local level that information needs to come through. We need to make sure that that information becomes actionable. So that's why we're also zooming in on the two districts and demonstrate how that information can really be uptaken by local communities. And my colleague will also give some indications how that can work. Um, so on one hand, we want to also make sure that our forecasts become more actionable, making that we would like to look at uh, areas of potential flood risk in the next 24 to 48 hours, becoming, of course, more critical information for action. And that's why we want to also move into early action protocols with our civil society partners to make sure that we ensure proactive disaster risk management for the community. And that these are in place also before the disaster strikes. And one of the elements we are we're piloting experimentally, and this is an example from uh, the Idai flooding, where we uh, focus on forecasting areas that may be flooded in the next uh, 24 hours. This is an example from the Beira area uh, just before uh, Idai um, struck. So we get an indication that this is possible and that we can provide that information for better uh, risk assessment and action on the ground before disaster strikes. And then I would like to give the floor to my colleague uh, from uh, communication information to give us uh, a bit of an overview of elements that uh, they are contributing to this project. I mean, please. Thank you so much, uh, Kun. Uh, I will be talking about uh, the role of media in support of uh, early warning and uh, community resilience. And uh, we are supporting this project, uh, starting with a little bit of background or assumptions. And the first one is one the media did not do enough in the previous disaster, or they were supposed to have done more. And this is based on the assessment we conducted at the Cyclone Idai, which shows that there was hardly any communication prior to the disaster itself from the media compared to after the disaster. And of course, there are several other lessons learned, including sensationalization of uh, information, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the first premise. The second one is the assumption that we already have community communication mechanisms in place, which can be harnessed for early warning and community resilience. For instance, you have football teams, you have church networks, you have, uh, we had a meeting with persons with disabilities who confirmed to us that they, ha they have WhatsApp groups in the community. So how can we harness all of this? So these are two assumptions that we, we are having. And we think the media can be a group, can bring all of this together to support early warning and uh, community resilience. So, and that we are going to support the establishment of community radios. And uh, that is because community radio is the best media. Why? Because it's managed by the community. Uh, the programming is um, done by the community itself. And it's about community related issues of concern. Uh, so through this project, we are going to establish three community radio stations uh, in collaboration with the Ministry of Information uh, to strengthen the existing communication channels and to become a more reliable source of proactive flood and drought early warning communication and dissemination. Following which there will be community radio programs. Uh, of sharing various best practices, not only among the communities but also with national stakeholders, provincial stakeholders, and all the other players, including the meteorological department. In other countries where UNESCO has worked, the meteorological department has been working very close with the community radios. In fact, they even send on daily basis uh, some of the meteorological uh, reports 
and they have an agreement with the community radio. So the community radios can be very instrumental in this uh, aspect, but not only that in food security and many other areas which are related to community resilience. Um, uh, we'll also link local experts um, with the uh, community radios. So they will be producing programs supporting the community, really supporting the engagement of the community in resilience building. But also one of the things they're going to do is to strengthen and establish a volunteer correspondence network. These correspondents are based in the community itself. So apart from data gathering and information dissemination, we can also use them for other purposes. For instance, if you have a research and you want data to be collected, we'll have this correspondence uh, a network who can help us. But also the community radios will be linked to national disaster relief mechanisms. Um, uh, so they, they won't be just operating you know, uh, on their own, but they'll be linked to other initiatives at the national level. Uh, so far, um, we have already secured an agreement with the government through the Ministry of uh, Communication and the Broadcasting, Broadcasting Authority of uh, Zimbabwe Buzz for three licenses in uh, Manika land. And uh, the frequencies have already been issued. So we have the green light to proceed this uh, uh, project. So that's what we have in Inertia. Over back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alamin. And that's also quite, quite good news. I think that we can really roll it out as soon as possible. Um, so continuing just uh, two more slides um, on the um, approach. So we also, of course, want to look into adaptation pathways, adaptation actions, and looking at what is feasible indeed, uh, taking into account, of course, all the socioeconomic conditions of the area. So that would be uh, looking at both ecosystem services and water and making sure that the, the solutions provided can make sure that those um, securities are met at all times. But also looking at uh, newer opportunities, for example, nature-based solutions and looking at, as we call, eco-engineering. So not only looking at the engineering side of things, but also making sure that the ecological components are there. And we're looking for co-benefits so that basically those elements can be optimized. And finally, uh, also making reference to um, what we call um, biosphere reserves. And biosphere reserves uh, are UNESCO designated sites uh, nominated by the country where we have science for sustainability support. So basically, they are ideal entities for testing interdisciplinary approaches and specifically looking at the interactions between social and ecological systems, but also looking at climate change adaptation, conflict prevention and management of biodiversity. And just on the right, you can see what a biosphere is. It's basically part of a, um, a larger community where we have a core area, which is often a national park or, or natural protected area. We also have communities living next door uh, in the buffer area in the transition zone with whom we would like to engage and make sure that we also work with them to come to more, more sustainable practices and make sure that everyone benefits from that uh, interaction. So in this sense, we, uh, we aim for supporting the national government and specifically the communities in the area to look for an opportunity to uh, develop a Chimanimani biosphere reserve. And we also know that on the Mozambican side, there's also a lot of interest to do a similar process to make sure that we secure long-term ownership and sustainability of the climate change adaptation work, but also to ensure long-term benefits of the infrastructure investments in and under the ZERP. So with that, I just want to finalize this very short introduction presentation, and I think then we can go to the next uh, element, looking at the signature of the agreement. Thank you. Right. I would like to invite my colleagues maybe to bring the signature so we can actually uh, move towards the signing ceremony. Okay, you swap if you want. Swap. <laughs> no. 
give you this one. And I get that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, have to, uh, to do a few more, but keep <laughs> <laughs> them, them signing. Yes. Uh, so with that, I would like to um, give the floor now to our um, invitee for, of honor, uh, Ms. Becky Manzo. She's director for the Meteorological Service Department and also a very close um, ally for collaboration. And I would like to give the floor to her to give a few words and vote of thanks, please. Uh, Should be working. All right, yeah. Thank you so much, Kun. Uh, it's really a relief to come out. <laughs> <laughs> See real people. <laughs> uh, despite the fact that I'm in the middle of another Zoom meeting, I just told myself this one I can't, I can't miss just to get out and to see real people because when we meet on Zoom, it's not the same. So yeah, it's a risk uh, worth taking, but there's no risk because we are, social distancing is there and our masks are on. So thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I would like to acknowledge the presence of, our, of the regional director and representative of UNESCO, uh, of the UNESCO Regional Office for Southern Africa. Uh, I won't pronounce your name <laughs> because <laughs> you know how the H is different from the English, the Germans, and uh, so uh, forgive me for not pronouncing your name, uh, although I heard it's cool, but not, you know, so I won't do that. And I also acknowledge the presence of the country manager of the United Nations office for the project office. I was also happy to be here to experience uh, sunny weather in Zimbabwe because I come from the med department. I always want to talk about the weather. <laughs> and uh, we are experiencing the dry spell. This time around, we appreciate the dry spell because the rains have been quite something this year. Uh, it's normal to above normal, but it has been too much above for most people and for most um of our stakeholders, only those who are interested in the levels of the terms are really excited about. <laughs> so at this point, allow me to say all protocols observed. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm highly honored to be here, uh, especially to deliver the vote of thanks after such a meeting, which was so full of such information uh, as we commemorate uh, the second year after he died. It's always good to do something when in remembrance, when you have something good, than just to sit there and to start uh, crying. And But if you do something positive, I believe it's the, it's the best way to commemorate that. So this signing ceremony of the project, uh, which you, ent you entitled Comprehensive Resilience Building, uh, in the Chimani Man and Chipinge districts, uh, which is part of the larger Zimbabwe Dai recovery project. I'd like to thank you all for participating in this critical event uh, that marks the commitment to supporting vulnerable commun communities mm -hmm. against the natural disasters that are being faced in the country and our region. So thank you very much for, for participating. I would like to thank the director of UNESCO, uh, the prof, for enlightening us with his insightful subject. A true professor is someone who makes a complicated subject very easy for someone to comprehend. <laughs> it's no use to be a professor and you cannot uh, deliver your information to people. So we really appreciate that, prof. Thank you very much. Uh, all the UN, UN agencies involved in this collaborative effort are also appreciated as this effort will not only change the lives of the vulnerable, uh, climate, climate vulnerable communities, but it is an important step towards the attainment of most of the SDGs. We talk so many times of the SDGs and it's important uh, that the, uh, 
we go beyond the talk. We walk the talk. So allow me to also thank the World Bank and UNOPS for their financial support and management. Uh, this project is uh, one of the present is, uh, I think it was con, as they say, it is, you put in the money and so many UN agencies, no, it was bad. <laughs> you put in uh, the money from the World Bank and so many UN agencies uh, go to that place. We need an agency which can manage that very well. And I've seen how UNOPS works. They're so efficient. They, 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 they pay attention to detail and they take their time, although they make sure they keep to the schedule. So I really personally and uh, the MSD appreciate how UNOPS has worked um, as the midwife among so many UN agencies. So you, you NOPS, uh, we thank you for your financial support and management, which is providing direct and needed support to the communities that we are affected by. <coughs> so ladies and gentlemen, as mentioned already uh, by the director of UNESCO, his opening remarks, climate-induced disasters have negatively impacted our country. We have not been safe from that. We have witnessed droughts, floods, and landslides, um, as well as other meteorological hazards. So today I'm not proud to be from the Met because most of the hazards that affect us as a nation, <laughs> they come from Met. But uh, from today's meeting, uh, <coughs> You are, you are being proactive. So come rain, come sunshine, I know the nation will be prepared. So these hazards have caused a remarkable damage to property, infrastructure, and the lives of the vulnerable men, children, and women. So, it, if so many times we leave out the men, but the men can also be vulnerable. So this calls for urgent action by all stakeholders to ensure we move towards a more proactive disaster risk reduction. As already mentioned, we cannot prevent disasters, but once disaster strikes, if we are prepared, the impact is lessened. I would like to take this opportunity, therefore, to acknowledge the continuous effort of UNESCO in addressing the impacts of these water-related hazards in the country. Specifically, you know, uh, UNESCO has been playing an active role in supporting the establishment of the Zimbabwe National Framework for Climate Services, which the uh, Meteorological Services is leading and which will further support the country in addressing its climate risks. Uh, the National Framework for Climate Services is crucial because we are dealing with the different uh, sectors. So for those sectors, they, they, they tell us as MSD what they really want us to give them. So we are giving them their weather and climate um, in a way that it packaged in a way that they need it. Water, for example, the water sector would like to know how much the rain they are receiving. Maybe it's for their dams to see the levels. Uh, you go to, to energy, they want to see whether I will have enough hydroelectricity. You go to health, they also have different needs, yet it's the same weather and climate. So the way we package it, we need the communication here to help us to reach them, those community radios, because they will then explain the information that is well understood to those communities. So when the community uh, radios are... Um, uh, started uh, to be given licenses as med department we were very excited because our um, our seasonal forecasts uh, we normally translate it into the 16 languages in the nation but we translate it and we put it in pamphlets but with the coming of these uh, community radios it means that the the seasonal forecast which is a very important tool can now be heard by everyone in their own language. It's amazing, uh, you dream in your own language and you think in your own language, 
when you translate, maybe uh, when I translate it, it might not be the same. If I'm like when I'm thinking in my in my mother tongue, so we really appreciate that we'll be able to communicate uh, uh, using that. So the efforts uh, will further strengthen uh, this new initiative, particularly with the focus on the vulnerable communities in the Chipinge Chimani Mani district. And you will realize that in Chipinge and in Chimani Mani. Uh, we may say there are two major languages in Zimbabwe, uh, but the kind of uh, Shona that is spoken in Chiping and Chimanimani is very different. They, they truly may not understand. Now we believe that they will be able to will be able to reach out to them. Therefore, on behalf of the Meteorological Services Department, let me take this opportunity to express the eagerness of my department to continue this fruitful collaboration with UNESCO and all these uh, partners and to support the successful implementation of this new project. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Manzo, uh, for those uh, vote of thanks. And I think we can then go to the closing remarks and we'd like to invite uh, Ms. Tondrae Fadzai Naume, uh, co-task team leader uh, of the ZERP from the National World Bank Office. Please, Ms. Tsondrai, if you could uh, come in. I think, you, yeah, there she is. Go ahead, please. Okay, thank you very much. And um, um, it's very unfortunate that I cannot be with you um, physically, but uh, a pleasant morning to, to you all. Uh, uh, it would have really been great sitting in that room with um, the rest of you, uh, particularly on this uh, very important day. Um, when we uh, bring in UNESCO to the partnership. So I'm really looking forward to better times when restrictions from the World Bank can be lifted and we can be in the same room. So uh, without uh, taking much time and uh, acknowledging all that have been in the room, that are in the room that have been acknowledged, let me quickly go to my closing remarks, but uh, to start by thanking all the previous speakers for providing the background and uh, the value add of having UNESCO to this unique partnership and way of working that uh, Jibrila has alluded to. Uh, in my closing remarks, I'll focus on uh, three key issues. The first one being the commitment by the World Bank to this uh, uh, program. As the World Bank, while our goals are to end extreme poverty and promote our shared prosperity in a sustainable way, there are three priorities that guide our work with countries as we seek to end poverty and boost our, our prosperity for the poorest uh, people. The first is helping to create a sustainable economic growth. Secondly, uh, investing in people. And the third is building resilience to shocks and threats that can roll back decades of progress. So therefore, we were quick to respond when uh, Idai hit um, two years ago in assessing the damages and developing uh, the Zimbabwe Rapid Impact and Needs Assessment, which has now become the framework for uh, our recovery response. Following the assistance appealed by the government, the World Bank provided a grant of 72 million to support recovery efforts in cyclone Idai affected areas through uh, ZERP uh, managed by UNOPS. The second aspect that I will um, turn my attention to is the impact of ZEP um, so far. So the ZEP model of a one project, one team with UN agencies working as one unified and uh, synergistic uh, model has certainly borne uh, results. Some of those have been spoken about this morning, but we also note from the bank that significant progress has been made since its inception uh, in September, 2019 with nearly 240,000 people benefiting from conditional uh, and unconditional food uh, assistance. More than 383,000 people are uh, having assessed integrated health services and over 88,000 uh, students having received learning supplies 
and 4,500 households now having access to clean water and sanitation services. The integration and complementarity between the UN agencies, um, as UNESCO can see, has amplified the impact of the work in the cyclone affected communities. By selecting specialist agencies to provide technical support through the UN and U through UN and UN agreements, CEP has provided greater efficiency through coordination. And uh, we hope this is further enhanced by uh, the coming in of UNESCO. The third aspect that I would like to uh, speak to uh, in my closing remarks is the resilience building and disaster risk reduction. So it is therefore gratifying to see that this model scale up from an initial five agencies to eight agencies with engagement of UNESCO today will be critical. This new partnership with uh, the specialist arm for disaster risk management will go a long way in building resilience of the vulnerable communities against climatic uh, disasters. As we build back better, we do need to ensure that never again will we witness the level of devastation that occurred when Cyclone Idai hit uh, in Zimbabwe. And it thus gives me great pleasure on behalf of the bank to welcome uh, UNESCO to the Idai Recovery Project. So in conclusion, I would like to thank all the stakeholders. You've been thanked before, but let me also highlight that, including the Meteorological Services Department that have made this partnership possible, uh, Ms. Becky Manzo and your team. It is my great conviction that this partnership today will complement the efforts by other partners under ZERP and build peace of the minds of women and men in Chimani Mani, including also children, uh, being inclusive uh, in Chimani Mani and Chipinge, be assured of the World Bank support to ensure the smooth implementation and ultimate success of this project program. We are one project, one team. Welcome UNESCO and thank you. And I think with that, we can close the session, if that's okay for everyone. And I would thank also the people on the, on the call online to join us in the, this important signing ceremony. Thank you very much and have a good day and have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Bye. I think